hello. Thank you very much uh, for joining the, uh, the 10K uh, subscriber celebration. Champagne, flower necklace, congratulations sign. I've gone all out. I'm even wearing an appropriate t-shirt. I don't know how well you can all see this, uh, but I'm wearing my um, sort of American dollar t-shirt uh, because today you've all voted this week that you want me to explain the millennium problems. Uh, and these, of course, are the seven biggest unsolved problems in all of maths. And each of them is worth a nice, cool $1 million. So I figured wearing my, my million dollar t-shirt was pretty appropriate uh, for the topic that I'm going to be discussing during the live stream. So the plan is, uh, as I said, you've all voted for this. You wanted to hear about the Millennium Problem. So I'm going to try my best to cover uh, as many of them as I can. So of course, there are seven. Uh, so I'm going to do uh, six of them, sort of short and sweet. Some of them I'll go into more detail than others, as you will see. That kind of depends on how much I like them and how much I feel I can confidently uh, talk about them and explain the maths behind them. Because of course, they're all difficult. I should emphasize this uh, to even a mathematician such as myself. Um, and then, so I'm going to do the first six. And then at the end, when I get to Navia Stokes, which of course is the one I do know more about, uh, being my area of research, fluid mechanics, for Navia Stokes, uh, again, you all voted and wanted to see me perform uh, equation stripped live for Navia Stokes. So that's the plan. I'll do the other six Millennium Problems first. I don't know exactly how long that will take. We'll see how carried away I get and how, you know, I guess what questions you guys ask as well. Uh, and then at the end, I will do the seventh and final Millennium Problem as Navia Stokes, and I will do it in the form of equation stripped. So there will be some level of nudity. I will obviously not go beyond my boxes, <laughs> this being family friendly, being YouTube. Uh, but just as a warning, I will be at some point taking off my clothes towards the end um, of the live stream. So without further ado, I guess I'd better get started talking about Millennium Problems. I'll just have another sip of my champagne. <laughs> so as you can see, this is my second glass. This is why I forgot to turn my lights on at the beginning. I've been very much uh, enjoying myself today and preparing for this live stream, making the most of the fact that it's a celebration. So if, if you're all, unfortunately, YouTube doesn't let me see people tuning in. But if you're all there at home, grab yourselves a glass of champagne. This is definitely a celebration. Right, so um, Millennium Problems. This is where we're going to kick off. Um, and I also uh, should have mentioned, I, of course, have a nice new studio, which you may have noticed, apart from the wardrobe kind of blocking part of the board. Other than that, we've got a nice new uh, setup going on here. So I hope you like it. Um, so the Millennium Problems. These are the, um, the seven biggest unsolved problems in maths at the turn of the millennium. So the idea here was pretty much, I, I do remember this. I was about 10 uh, at the time. And I do remember when the, the new millennium was happening, when the year 2000 was coming around, it was quite a big deal, right? You know, we're alive at the turn of a millennium. It's pretty exciting. And everybody kind of wanted to um, like jump on the bandwagon and do something special to celebrate the fact that it was a new millennium. Uh, this like Y2K, as it was also known for some reason, sounded cooler back uh, 20 years ago. And um, maths basically got on board with this idea. So maths as a subject, as a field, decided we should do something special to also celebrate the millennium. And the Clay Institute, a, um, a, a mathematical institute in America, which supports lots of educational uh, activities and research. They have lots of money that they give out uh, to various good sort of um, projects. Uh, they decided that they wanted to help to encourage more people to do maths and do maths research. And one of the ideas they came up with was to create the Millennium Problems. So this is the list of um, seven biggest unsolved problems in the year 2000. This was decided by uh, a group that called the Scientific Advisory Board of the Clay Institute. And um, the Scientific Advisory Board was made up of very famous mathematicians at the time. So uh, Sir Michael Atia was on the advisory board, and as was John Nash, who's very famous, uh, sort of his work in economics and maths and the overlap there. Um, so along with various other uh, big name sort of mathematicians at the time. And between them, they decided on what they thought were the seven uh, biggest unsolved problems in maths, and then said, right, Clay Institute, we're going to give whoever can solve these problems a uh, million dollars. 
So sort of the, the gauntlet, the challenge was set, the gauntlet was laid. Uh, and I guess some of us, anyway, as mathematicians, have been trying to solve these problems ever since to try and earn uh, the million dollars. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is perhaps the most famous. Uh, so I'm going to start with, of course, Riemann uh, and the Riemann hypothesis. So I might just remove my congratulations sign just so I have more board space. <laughs> so I'll just take that down. <laughs> I could have done with it being like a ribbon or something, so I could wear like a congratulations sash or something, really. But, um, okay, so I, I tell you what I'll do. I'll stick, it on my, I'll stick it on my wardrobe so it's still in the shot, right? Because as I said, this is very much a celebration. This isn't your usual live stream. This is, we're having fun celebrating maths and celebrating all of you guys being super awesome and subscribing to my channel. Um, okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is the, the Riemann hypothesis. Uh, so, what is the Riemann hypothesis? Riemann hypothesis. All right. So, in, in short, the Riemann hypothesis asks, um, when is the following function, zeta of s, when is this equal to zero? And this function uh, can be written as the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the power s. So the Riemann hypothesis is all to do with this, this Riemann zeta function, which looks like this. It's just a sum of various powers of, uh, of the integers. n here is going from 1 to infinity, so the whole numbers. And we're going to add all of these things together, and we want to know when could this possibly be 0. That's ultimately, fundamentally, what the Riemann hypothesis is asking. And as well as wanting to know when this is zero, or sorry, we, we want to know when it's zero, but the Riemann hypothesis in particular says that all of the um, non-trivial zeros of this function um, have the real part of s equal to a half. So s here in this formula um, is a complex number. It could also be, of course, a real number, because real numbers are a subset of the complex numbers. So s here um, could be a complex number. And the Riemann hypothesis basically says all of the non-trivial zeros have the real part of s equal to a half. And you get a million dollars if you can prove or disprove this statement. So disproving it, in theory, would be really easy. Because if you, if you need to disprove this statement, you've just got to find one value of s that makes this sum zero uh, when the real part of s is not a half. If you can find that particular value of s that makes this function zero and the real part of s is not one half, you get a million dollars, right? So you can disprove it. You don't have to have a proof. So if you can do that, you get a million dollars. And what we actually think is true is that this is true I think the vast, vast, vast majority, over 99% of mathematicians would agree with me, I, I hope, that the Riemann hypothesis, we think it should be true. Um, so to actually do the proof is way more involved than coming up with the counterexample. But we think that it is true, so therefore you are going to need to prove it. So you either prove this statement or find a counterexample and you get your million dollars. Now, the... Um, the Riemann hypothesis, when it's discussed in general terms, is talked about as uh, something to do with the prime numbers, right? So often it's said that uh, if we were able to have a proof of the Riemann hypothesis or able to solve the Riemann hypothesis, it would really help us when it came to understanding uh, the prime numbers. Just having some more champagne. Um, it would really help us to understand the prime numbers. And what I thought would be perhaps interesting to do here, rather than going to really, really complex discussions about analytic continuation and various things that require a maths degree, I thought it'd be more fun for us to try and think about what this function, the Riemann zeta function, has to do with the prime numbers. Okay, so there's a famous formula, um, which was courtesy of Euler, which says that the zeta function, zeta of s here, which is the sum of 1 over n to the power s, can in fact be expressed, and this is courtesy of Euler, 
can be expressed as the product over P prime of 1 divided by 1 minus P to the minus S. So this is saying that the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of 1 divided by n to the power s, the sum fixed value of s, is equal to, according to our favorite, well, my favorite mathematician, Leonard Euler, is equal to the product over all of all possible prime numbers of this thing multiplied together, where each p, you have a different prime number. And again, this is true for a fixed value of s in each of these locations. Now, this is something that if you know anything about Riemann hypothesis, Riemann zeta function, you've probably come across this result before. You've probably seen somewhere that the zeta function is equal to this product of primes. But I think, or at least something I actually wasn't really aware of until like, surprisingly recently, was how you can actually prove this. How do you go about showing that this summation is equal to this product? So it's an infinite sum and an infinite product. So trying to show they're equal is actually uh, quite a fun calculation. So that's what uh, we're going to go through. So uh, I need my board eraser. Um, the way I like to think about this is as follows. Um, so I have, um, let's write out uh, zeta of s sort of as a sum, right? So if I were to say, I can say that zeta of s is equal to the first term is 1 over 1 to the s, so that's just 1. Then I've got plus 1 over 2 to the s, plus 1 over 3 to the s, plus 1 over 4 to the s, plus... And then we just carry on, dot, 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 forever. Now, we've got to turn this into a product involving prime numbers. Uh, and this actually uses a very clever technique um, from the Greeks, which is called the prime number sieve. And it works as follows. You start by considering 1 divided by 2 to the s times zeta of s. So this is why it's called a prime sieve, because 2, of course, is a prime number. So I'm considering multiplying a prime number by my actual function. And when I do this, let's just write out what it is. I get 1 over 1 times 1 over 2 to the s is 1 over 2 to the s. 1 over 2 to the s times 1 over 2 to the s, that's just 1 over 4 to the s. 1 over 2 times 3, so that's 1 over 6 to the s, etc. So this particular expression contains all of the even numbers on the denominator. So we go 2, 4, 6, 8. We just have all of the even numbers on our denominator. Now. If I therefore do the top line, z of s minus the bottom one, then I will get um, zeta of s times 1 minus that. So this is zeta of s minus uh, zeta of s divided by 2 to the s, which is this term. Then I've got all of the numbers minus the even numbers. So I just get the odd numbers. That's what I'm left with. So this thing will just be 1 plus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 5 whoops, to the s plus 1 over 7 to the s plus dot, dot, dot. So now I've just got the odd numbers. Now, I can do the same trick again. Why stop here? Why here we just multiply by 1 over 2 to the s and then subtracted away all of those numbers? And that left me with just the odd terms. If I now do 1 over 3 to the s times this, I'll get 1 over 3 plus 2 times 3 is 6 plus 3 times 3 is 9. So I now, instead of having the even numbers, um, where have I put my eraser? There it is. So now instead of having the even numbers, I've got all of the powers of 3. So if I also subtract off uh, the same thing again, so if I now do this thing, all of the odd numbers, minus 1 over 3 to the s, zeta of s, that gives me this factor here, then I also lose my powers of 3. So this has now become 
one plus, they would have next one would be one over five, plus one over seven, plus eight has gone because it's even, nine has gone, it's a power of three, ten's gone because it's even, the next one would be 11, plus dot, dot, dot. And so now I can keep doing this. You'll notice that the numbers I'm left with are starting to look very much like the prime numbers. Of course, I would have, uh, for example, there would be a 25 would eventually appear in there. But if I keep doing the same trick of subtracting off or multiplying by 1 minus 1 over prime number to the s, I begin to rule out all of these various factors. And because the prime numbers build up every single other number, if you do this for all of the primes, you're just left with 1. So, to summarize that, we've started with this is zeta to the s, and then what we've done is subtracted off um, all of these bits. So I've got like dot, dot, dot coming in, and then I've done 1 minus 1 over 5 to the s, down to 1 minus 1 over 3 to the s, down to 1 minus 1 over 2 to the s times zeta of s. And because I've done this for every single prime number, the only thing I'm left with is 1. So I've got this infinite product shown by these three dots here. So it carries, you know, these numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. It'd be seven, then 11, then 13. And I've got this infinite product equal to one. So if I now just divide both sides by the product, I've got zeta of s is one divided by one minus the prime to the minus s. So exactly what each of these terms are. This is p equals five. This one is p equals three. And this is p equals two. So that is sort of where this formula comes from. And then because we now have this relationship between the zeta function and the prime numbers, this is, this is quite a subtle idea, but this is why the Riemann hypothesis is talked about um, the fact that if we were to prove it, it would help us understand the prime numbers. So we are pretty certain it's true. So it's not the result of the Riemann hypothesis itself that actually tells us more about the prime numbers. It's not that. The, re the way we're going to find more out about the primes through a proof of this um, millennium problem is because in order to prove it, we're probably, not necessarily, but we are pretty likely to have to use this relationship. And so a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, again, not the result itself, because we're pretty sure that's true. But in order to prove it, it's possibly going to involve using this formula. And therefore, there must, it's very likely that there must be some new knowledge about the prime numbers that was used in the proof. So just to reiterate, if we prove the Riemann hypothesis, it doesn't necessarily mean we know anything new about the prime numbers. The hypothesis itself doesn't tell us anything specifically about the prime numbers. The key idea is a proof of it will almost certainly involve this product, which will therefore involve new knowledge about the prime numbers. So whenever the Riemann hypothesis is talked about in reference to prime numbers, it's because we're probably going to have to learn something new about the primes in order to be able to prove Riemann. Right, I've talked definitely long enough on the first one, see, because I'm trying to do seven here. Uh, so I better move on to the second one. Um, so that is my, uh, I hope I've vaguely explained what the Riemann hypothesis is. As I said, purposefully don't want to go into real detail because I could do hours on it. Right, so that was the first one. Um, next on my list is uh, P versus MP. Of course, there's, there, is, there is an actual order to these if you look at the, uh, the Clay Institute website. Uh, I, think, I don't think I'm completely following it, but it's something like the order I think I'm planning to do them in. Um, so P versus MP is going to be next. Um, so this is number two, P versus MP. Right. Um, so the million dollar question here is to do with... Um, Basically, how fast computers can calculate and solve problems. 
Uh, so this is why P versus MP is often used in sci-fi movies. Uh, I think it was referenced in uh, Will Smith, Will Smith's movie, I, Robot. I'm pretty sure they referenced P versus MP, uh, which is amazing that they mentioned such an advanced uh, maths problem in a, in a big Hollywood movie. Um, and the reason they do that is because it's all about computational power of computers. So the, the idea is as follows. We have two types of problem, P and NP. That's why it's P versus NP. Um, and we have uh, NP problems, which you basically can say are uh, problems a computer can um, check the solution easily. So this uh, just means that if you have a given problem uh, that you want a computer to solve, um, or a given problem you're interested in, you can set up the problem for the computer, and then you can give it a solution, and it will quickly, the computer can check and tell you yes or no, is your solution correct to the parameters of the problem. So NP problems can be checked easily. Now, P problems, you can solve these easily. And when I say easily, we're talking about the computational power required to solve the problem. So how fast a computer can do it. Uh, of course, in real time, right, <laughs> we're saying here, uh, you know, to us it seems ridiculous how fast computers can work, obviously much faster than the human brain. Uh, for, you know, say, arithmetic and things. But here we're talking about sort of speed in the context of a computer. So it's often referred to as a polynomial time or exponential time and things like that. That's the kind of uh, sort of uh, technical jargon that we're dealing with. So NP problems can be checked easily and quickly. So you can verify a solution quickly. But P problems, you can solve them. You can find the solution quickly and easily. So... We then have, comparing the two, you have like this kind of Venn diagram situation. So you've got, if this is NP, these are all of my NP problems. So anything in this circle can be easily um, checked. The solution can be easily checked. Now, if I have a problem which is P, if I have a problem where a computer can easily find the solution, then automatically it can easily check the solution. So you have to think about this one for a second. So the idea is if a computer can easily and quickly solve a problem, then it automatically can easily and quickly verify or check the solution. Because to check a solution, the computer can just solve the, the problem anyway. Okay? So just to, again, this is the kind of the, the like, uh, what's the word? This is the, where it's a little bit technical. But the idea is, again, anything that is P, anything that can be solved easily is automatically NP. Because if a computer needs to check a solution and it can very quickly find the solution in the first place, it's just going to solve it really quickly and then check. So automatically, anything that's P has to be inside here. So all of the problems which are P are automatically inside NP as well, because if it's easy to solve it, the computer will just find the solution and then it can check it really easily as well. And then the million dollar question is, is this bit in between, so the bit I've shaded, the million dollar question is, is this actually empty? So it kind of says the million dollars is, does P equal NP? So we know that P is inside NP. So P is definitely contained in NP, because anything that's in P, anything that's easy to solve is easy to check. P is definitely inside NP. But we don't know if NP is inside P. If we can show that NP is inside P, that means they're equal, and that means you get a million dollars. Or maybe they're not the same thing. So maybe there's something here, perhaps some particular problem, some type of problem, which is NP and not P. And then this would not 
be equal. And you have to show either of those things. You either show that P is equal to NP, you get a million dollars. You show P isn't equal to NP, you also get the million dollars. It's kind of like the Riemann one. It's good. You don't have to prove it. You can either you can disprove it or prove it. Um, from the experts I've spoken to, we believe this to be true. We think P is equal to NP. Um, no, we don't. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong way around. We think P and NP are not equal. And the reason possibly uh, that we might think this, or to give you a bit of a feel for, for what I'm talking about for an NP problem, uh, is something called the traveling salesman. So the idea of the traveling salesman um, is kind of the clues in the name. So imagine I am, oh, shouldn't have rubbed that off. So imagine I'm going around selling things. Let's say I'm selling flowery necklaces because I, you know, I've loved wearing mine so much that I'm going to go around and sell them. So the traveling salesman problem says, um, is it possible, so is it possible for me selling my flowery necklace, necklaces to visit, let's say, a hundred different towns because I want, you know, these things are pretty popular. Everyone wants one. So I want to visit a hundred different towns, but I have to do it in under, uh, let's say, in under a thousand miles because my car, my car is pretty old, so I can't, I can't drive forever. So the question is, can I find a route between 100 specified towns? So let's say there are 100 places around England. I want to visit all 100 of these, but I have to do it in under 1,000 miles, right? Because I have a limit to how far I'm willing to travel or because my car is going to break down after 1,000 miles. Now, this is the traveling salesman problem. And this, at the moment, is what we would call an NP problem. Because it's really, really easy to check the solution. I, if I give you what I think is a solution, or I give a computer what I think is a valid solution to this problem, it's got two things to check. Do the names of all 100 towns appear on that list? If yes, then we move on. If no, it's not a solution, because it doesn't visit all the towns. Question two, is the total distance less than 1,000 miles? If yes, we have a valid solution. We visited all 1,000, uh, sorry, all 100 towns in under 1,000 miles. If no, then it's not a valid solution. So it's super easy to check the answer, but to solve this problem is actually really, really hard. And this is kind of another way of thinking about the million dollar question. So at the moment, to try and find this solution, the pretty much, right, okay, there are slightly more sophisticated algorithms, but in general, the way to think about it is if you need to check if a route between 100 places exists, you kind of have to check all possible routes. So you imagine you've got to um, try and check all of these different routes and see if any of them have a total length less than 1,000. So to make your first choice of where to start, you have 100 choices of where to start because you have 100 towns. So I'm allowed to start wherever I want. And then I have, after starting, let's say I'm starting in Oxford, then I want to go to, um, well, wherever I'm going next, there are 99 towns left on my list for me to now visit. So I have 99 choices. And now I've visited two places. There are 98 left, so I have 98 choices. And you continue all the way down two times two, and then one at the end. So the total number of possible routes is actually 100 factorial, which is 100 times 99 times 98 times 97, all the way down to one. Now, this would be how, at the moment, approximately, a computer would try to solve this problem. And this is incredibly slow. This is really, really, really slow um, for a computer to do this. And to just emphasize how slow, uh, we can plug in some numbers. So the general formula for n towns, um, there are n factorial roots. So at the moment, approximately again, a computer would check all n factorial roots to see if it could find a solution where the total was less than 1,000 miles or whatever the distance, specified distance was. Now, <clears throat> if you plug in n equals 4, then the total number of roots, four factorial, four times three times two, that will give you 24. So we have 24 roots to check. Now that's not too bad, right? 
pretty much any computer could do that super quick. Just check. We could do this ourselves, in fact. You could check all 24 routes, see if any of them were less than the specified distance. Now, if you increase this to 10, then we have n factorial roots. So that's now 10 factorial roots. 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You multiply all those numbers together, uh, and I'm going to look up this answer because I want to make sure I get it right. Um, and you get 10 factorial is 3,628,800 roots. <clears throat> so we're definitely not doing that by hand. There's no way I am checking 3.6 million different routes to see if any of them are less than 1,000 uh, miles, right? Just not happening. But a computer maybe would do this. But of course, this is going to take a lot, lot longer than this one. So this is kind of giving a clue as to how these uh, problems become actually quite difficult for a computer to solve. This is why this is an NP problem. It's easy to check the answer. It's hard to find it. Because if I then went even further and made this n equals 100, if you calculate 100 factorial, I think it's like 9 times 9 and then 157 zeros or something. It's something like, I think it's 9 times 10 to the 157. And if you took the world's fastest supercomputer today and asked it to try and solve traveling salesman for 100 towns, like I've written here, with some maximum distance, the exact problem I wrote down, if you asked a computer, the world's fastest supercomputer, to solve this right now, it would take longer than the age of the universe, billions upon billions of years, in order to actually solve this problem on the world's fastest supercomputer we currently have. So the question is, is the traveling salesman problem actually just really difficult to solve? Is it an example of something that is NP and not P? It's easy to check, but it's hard to solve. Is, it, is that true? In which case, potentially, right, we have a, an example of something that's NP but not P, so P does not equal NP, hello million dollars. Or is it in fact that the method of checking all of the roots is actually just, as we can see, painfully slow. So is it a case that we just haven't yet found the correct way to solve the problem? So there's two ways of looking at this. Either the traveling salesman is an example of something which is NP and not P, and therefore P does not equal NP, or P does equal NP, and just this method is awful, and we just yet haven't discovered a better way to do it that would show the traveling salesman problem was in fact P. So in a nutshell, the traveling salesman problem kind of explains um, P versus NP. Um, my other fun favorite thing about this, which is why I picked N equals 10, favorite fun fact about this, if you go on Google Maps, you can literally try this right now. If you go on Google Maps and you go, um, and you can put in like, I want to go from A to B, and then you can add those points where it says via. So you can go A to B via C, via D, via E. The maximum you can put in is 10 different cities because on purpose, Google obviously doesn't want to break its own servers. Because if it, if it allowed you to enter 100 different locations and then you ask Google Maps to find the shortest route, it would basically break Google. So they have purposefully put in a feature that doesn't let you put in more than 10 different places so that they can still have a chance of solving it. Right, that'll do for P versus MP, because uh, again, I want to get through all of these problems. Um, so I think the others will be a bit shorter. Um, or I'd better make them a bit shorter if I'm going to get through this in the next half hour or so. Um, right, so next, what was on my list? Oh, next, I was going to do Yang Mills theory. OK, so we're going to look at the third one, uh, Yang Mills theory. And the mass gap hypothesis. OK, so this is our third uh, million dollar millennium problem. Now, uh, Yang Mills theory is all to do with uh, physics. It's all to do with quantum theory. 
And um, in short, Yang Mill's theory, this part, is what is used by physicists, uh, used by physicists to describe quantum fields. And um, the, the sort of million dollar question is, physicists have this theory, right, called Yang-Mills theory, and they use it to describe quantum fields. They do experiments to check the validity of Yang-Mills theory, and this is verified by experiments. So it's used to describe quantum fields, and it's verified by experiments, it's verified experimentally. And one part of this theory, one part of Yang Mill's theory, says there is something called the mass gap. So this appears in Yang Mill's theory. So one way of thinking about what a mass gap is, is sort of saying, um, well, we have like, we have a basically continuous spectrum of values for the mass. So the mass of an object can be really, really, really big all the way up to, you know, as large as you want. And it can go really, really, really small, but it stops. There is a definite minimum mass and then there's zero mass. So there's a gap. So mass itself is continuous, except when you get near zero, there is a gap between this non-zero value and zero. So it's no longer continuous when you get very close to zero. So that, in a nutshell, is the mass gap. And that pops up in Yang Mill's theory describing quantum fields. And the way you earn the million dollars is you have to take the physicist's theory and all of their experimental results, which show it to be true, and you need to formulate a rigorous mathematical theory to, um, that actually agrees with what the physicists see experimentally. So you've kind of got a go back to the very, very beginning, start from uh, some simple axioms about the quantum world, and from those axioms, build up a complete rigorous mathematical theory, which agrees with the physicists Yang Mills theory, and also demonstrates the mass gap. So it is important, the Millennium Problem itself does specify that your theory, your mathematical theory must verify and validate the mass gap. Um, so it's pretty abstract. It's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty complex. I spent a couple of weeks ago, I actually sat down with one of my colleagues um, at St. John's in Oxford, uh, Christopher Beeb. He's awesome, awesome chap. Uh, and he actually is doing research in this field. And we sat down and I think for about four hours and he attempted to try and explain to me uh, what uh, his interpretation of this problem. And it, the, the math involved is actually insane. Uh, if you've done any, well, if you've done very advanced maths, you may have heard of things called path integrals, uh, which are used by physicists. And it's all, as far as I could tell from his explanation, all to do with path integrals. Um, but big picture here, we're going for an overview of the problems, not the actual technical details. Big picture is physicists have a theory. It works. Their experiments verify their theory. Maths hasn't yet caught up with physics. So as mathematicians, we, the challenge is to go back and properly derive Yang Mill's theory from a set of axioms such that the resultant theory agrees with what physicists see. And that will get you a million dollars. Um, and it's a pretty exciting one. I like this one because you've kind of got to invent new maths uh, to be able to do this. Right? You are literally deriving a brand new mathematical model like sort of not too far akin from like Einstein's theory of relativity. Like Einstein did all of the complicated maths to come up with the theory. So here we've got the physics already telling us these things should be true. So the challenge is for mathematicians to catch up with the physicists. Right, and I'm gonna leave that one there. Short and sweet. Um, okay, uh, number four on our Millennium Problem list. Uh, the next one I've got here is gonna be the Birch and Swinton-Dyer conjecture, once I have 
another sip of champ champagne. Cheers. Um, so the Birch, the Swillison diet conjecture. It's our fourth one. Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture. Okay. Right. Uh, the Birch Swinerton Dyer conjecture is all to do with um, things called uh, elliptic curves. So an elliptic curve, an elliptic curve. So an elliptic curve has a particular form of equation. Uh, it's y squared equals uh, x cubed. Let me just check I've got that right. Yeah, x cubed plus ax uh, plus b, where a and b are your constant coefficients, constants. Right, so we've got two variables. We've got y and x. Two variables, and we have a single equation. So uh, in, you could think of this perhaps as the solution here uh, is sort of underdetermined because we have one equation but two variables, x and y. So if x and y were allowed to be real numbers, there are an infinite number of solutions to this equation, which could be seen by drawing the graph. Uh, so depending on the values of a and b, you get different graphs, but they have quite fun shapes. So um, I think I'll show you a couple. You can, of course, Google this and look it up. It's really interesting. You have one which kind of um, comes in, kind of does something like this, and then goes out. So this is for A and B, both non-zero. Um, and then I think if you either increase or decrease one of A or B, that's not very helpful. That covers everything. But if you slightly fix one, fix one parameter and slightly vary the other, it then causes um, like a pinching. So it causes these two bits to come closer and closer together. So this kind of comes down. And then eventually they pinch off and you get something where you have a circle. And I call this, I think of this as like a bow and arrow because this to me kind of looks like a bow. I don't know. Um, so this is like a bow and arrow type graph, and then this is the more general uh, sort of uh, continuous. Well, they're both continuous, but anyway, joined, path connected. There you go. That one's path connected. That one's not. That's uh, This one uh, is disjoint. Right. So anyway, elliptic curves, they look very fun. Um, and drawing the graph is giving me an infinite number of uh, solutions, right? Because I'm drawing this is y. Uh, and this is x. So clearly, all of the points along this graph are values of x and y satisfying this equation. Now, uh, the Birch Swinton Dyer conjecture then isn't just to do with solutions to this equation, but it's to do with a particular type of solution. So instead of saying x and y can be any real number, what we do is we say, well, we want x and y to be uh, rational. So we want them to belong to q which means they are rational numbers, right? So a rational number is a fraction. Just for in case uh, those of us who maybe haven't heard of them. So we want to consider rational or fraction solutions for x and y. And you can think of this as imposing an additional condition. So I said that we had a single one equation in two variables, but now, as well as satisfying the equation, we also say they have to be rational. So now we've kind of imposed an additional constraint on trying to find a solution. And then what we're interested in for the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture is given an elliptic curve, so if I call this elliptic curve E, given an elliptic curve E, I want to know uh, does E have finite, finitely or infinitely many rational infinitely many rational solutions. So this is something we're interested in. If you've ever studied elliptic curves, this is the kind of question you ask about an elliptic curve. Given your equation and you say, does it have finitely many or infinitely many rational solutions. And the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture basically says, is there a shortcut to answering this question? 
And we think there is, is the answer. So we think, according to, and I, I need to look this up because it's pretty, uh, it's pretty um, abstract name. Well, abstract, pretty complicated name. So we think that uh, we have a shortcut way of doing this. So we have something called the, uh, it's called the Hasse Vial L function. Hasse Vial L function. And it kind of actually looks a bit like the Riemann zeta function, a little bit. So we have the Hasse Vial L function. And then the Birch Swinnerton dyer, which is uh, L, and it's a function of your elliptic curve E. So you plug in your elliptic curve and some variable S. And then the Birch Swinnerton dyer conjecture, BSD for short, says if the Hasse Vial function of your elliptic curve when s is 1, right, so you plug in your elliptic curve, take your elliptic curve, plug it in here, put s equal to 1. If this is 0, then we have infinitely many rational solutions. And if this is not 0, otherwise, finitely many. And that's it in a nutshell. So, recap. Birch and Swinnerton dyer conjecture. Interest in elliptic curves. They, have, they always have this form. y squared equals x cubed plus something times x plus b. They are, they're actually used in cryptography, uh, and they're used as the encryption on iMessage. So any of you who have an iPhone and um, any of you who have an iPhone and use iMessage, you're actually, without realizing it, it's all reliant on the elliptic curves. So you, so they do have a very practical use. We're interested in elliptic curves. We're interested in specifically solutions to the elliptic curves, which are rational fractions. And then we want to know: does the does given a particular elliptic curve, does E have finite rational solutions or infinitely many rational solutions? That's what we want to know. And the birch and dyer conjecture says, well, there's an easy way to check this. You plug your elliptic curve into this hasse vial L function, very complicated thing, but you plug it in and set S to be 1. If that's 0, then you've got infinitely many. Otherwise, you've only got finitely many. But, so we, we've checked this for lots and lots of different elliptic curves, and it seems to be true, but we don't have a proof. So again, if you're a mathematician, you'll know just because something holds true for like 10,000 or 10 billion cases doesn't mean it's a proof, right? If you're a physicist and you do an experiment 10,000 times and get the same result, then you're happy. You're done, right? <laughs> as a physicist, that's, that's all you're going to need. But as a mathematician, you need this, this universal truth. You need the proof to say that it's definitely 100% true. So we think this is true, uh, but we don't have a proof. So that's Birch, Schwinnett, and Dyer. Right, three to go. Um, I'm trying to remember where I might go next. I think Hodge might be next, you know? Yeah, let's do Hodge conjecture. So Hodge is by far the most difficult <laughs> to understand as a non-expert. I don't know which one's the most difficult to solve. Probably Riemann, seeing as everyone's tried it. And no one's solved it yet. But um, in terms of the most difficult to understand is definitely the Hodge conjecture. So I'll do my best, everybody. I am going to have another drink of champagne, however. Okay, I think I need it. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain the Hodge conjecture. Okay, right. I'm going to start by writing out what the Hodge conjecture is. Um, because... I think I think we uh, I think the best way to try and get a feel for Hodge conjecture is I'll write out what it is and then I'll try and explain to you what each part means and then that's I think as good as we're going to get um, here. So um, this is five, isn't it? Five is the Hodge conjecture. Right. So our fifth million dollar prize. Um, problem says um, uh, 
let x be a non singular non singular complex projective manifold so already uh, I mean I, I won't lie I was a little lost when I first read this statement but bear with me I'm going to explain it all so x is this very complicated looking thing then the Hodge conjecture says um, then that implies that every Hodge class on X uh, is a linear combination, a linear combination uh, with rational coefficients. And we just talked about rational numbers, rational. With rational coefficients of the cohomology classes, homology classes of complex, nearly done, last three words, complex subvarieties of X. Right, and if you're lost, don't worry, I was lost the first time I saw this. Um, it's it's ridiculous, right? As I said, this is by far the most difficult Millennium problem to explain to a non-expert by an absolute mile. That's why it's generally not covered by most people. <laughs> but, you know, I said I'd do all of them, so we're going to do all of them. Now, let's think about some of these words. So I can get some different colors to help me out. Um, so what I should mention first is uh, the Hodge conjecture itself is all to do with uh, topology. Now, again, if you've done some university level maths, you, you've at least heard of topology, perhaps even studied it. Uh, topology can be thought of as uh, geometry without distance. So you no longer care about distances. So geometry, you know, to do with shapes and things. Topology, it's kind of geometry, but you don't care about distance as much. Um, so we're working in topology. And then we have this thing, x, which the Hodge conjecture is about. And x, the key word here, is it's a manifold. So what does it mean to be a manifold? That's the first thing we need to try and understand. Uh, so a manifold, again, from as simple terms as I think I can explain, a manifold is an object that when you're really close to it, that up close, looks like a 2D Euclidean plane. So, nice example for us all, the Earth is a manifold. The Earth is a sphere. And if anyone comments about flat Earth, <laughs> I will kick you out of the live chat. The Earth is a sphere. But from where I'm stood right now in Oxford, the Earth is flat. From where I'm stood, it looks to me like it's flat. So locally, the Earth behaves as though it's a flat plane. And so that is one of the uh, properties of a manifold. So all this means is up close uh, looks like a plane. Okay, so that's all it means. So it just says X is some object in topology that up close looks like a plane. Right, that's all we need. Then it says every Hodge class on X. So that's clearly some property to do with X. Every Hodge class is a linear combination with rational coefficients. Um, so all that means is you're building your Hodge class from smaller pieces. So you could have, if you had your Hodge class H, it's saying here, it's a linear combination. So it could be like alpha of the cohomology classes. So it could be alpha times, um, let's not call it x, alpha times y1 plus beta times y2 plus gamma times y3, where alpha, beta, and gamma are rational numbers, and y1, y2, and y3 are things called cohomology classes. 
and right um and that's kind of it right so let's just recap so the hodge conjecture the trickiest by million problem says um First of all, we're working in topology, right? So this is topology is this crazy world where donuts and teacups are the same thing. Um, just to, you know, it's like the classic thing that's uh, used when talking about topology. Now, we have this object X, which is a manifold, which means that up close, it looks like a plane. So think of the Earth. Up close, the Earth looks like a plane. So we have some object that's like that. That's all X is. Then the Hodge conjecture says every Hodge class on X, so that's just some property of X, every one of these is actually made up of smaller pieces added together. Now, these smaller pieces are other complicated things called cohomology classes. We don't really need to worry or even care about what they are. The, the problem itself, the million dollar question is given this thing X, can its Hodge class be made up from smaller pieces? If yes, then the Hodge conjecture is true. If no, then it's false. So when I think about uh, the Hodge conjecture, and I did this uh, in the article I wrote on my website, in fact, um, I talk about it as uh, asking, or I always give the example of building things from Lego. So you're just asking here, can I make my Hodge class from smaller building blocks, kind of like I've done here? That's pretty much it in a nutshell. To know exactly what those building blocks are, you pretty much need to study university level topology. So again, I'm gonna leave it there, but the Hodge conjecture asks, can you break down these objects in topology into smaller pieces? That's pretty much the million dollar question. And again, proof or disproof, you get your million dollars. Right, so that just leaves me with the final two. Um, so number six is going to be Poincaré, and then we will get to finally get to my favorite, Navier-Stokes. Okay. So the Poincaré conjecture, fortunately, I think I can actually explain this one, even though it's again um, in the world of topology, so things get pretty weird pretty quickly. Um, but the Poincaré conjecture, and I should also say, this is the one that's actually been solved. So if, if you know anything about the Millennium Problems, I'm sure you will have known that this is the one that's been solved. But if you didn't, this one has actually been solved, which is awesome. So the Poincaré conjecture um, was solved by a chap called Gregory Perelman in 2002 and 2003. Now, uh, what is it? Let's start there. So in 1904, uh, Poincaré, who the conjecture is named after, came along and basically said that in n dimensions, so in any number of dimensions, um, any smooth uh, finite uh, object with no holes. Again, I'm purposefully writing this without using technical terms, just in case anyone watching is a topologist. I am doing this on purpose. Um, in n dimensions, any smooth, finite object with no holes is basically, or can be deformed, shall we say, can be deformed into a sphere. into a n-sphere, is what I should say. Right, and that's kind of it. This one's, this one's a, bit, a bit more straightforward than the, uh, than the Hodge conjecture. So, this is what Poincaré said in 1904. If you take any dimensional space, so we're working in n dimensions, then if you take an object which is smooth, so it has no sharp edges, right? So it's, everything is nice and continuous, nice and smooth, object. It can certainly have bumps, but it cannot have sharp edges, no points or corners. So you have a smooth object. It has to be finite, so it cannot go on forever. It has to have some end to it. So that's kind of what this means. 
Um, the more technical term here would be closed uh, for the mathematicians amongst you. Um, so any smooth, finite object with no holes. So we cannot have our coffee cup or our donut, for example. We cannot have that. Um, has to have no holes, be smooth and be finite. Then we can turn it into a sphere. That's what we're saying here. We're saying it can be formed, be deformed into a sphere. Technical term it says is homeomorphic to a sphere. And technical term for having no holes means path connected. More or less. So the technical terms are in brackets for those of you who know more about topology. But don't worry if you don't. It just says in whatever dimension I'm in, if I've got something that's smooth, no sharp edges. This is, you know, we're thinking about shapes here. So I've got a shape. It's got no sharp edges. It's finite. So it doesn't, doesn't go on forever. And it has no holes in it. Then I can turn it into a sphere. And when I say sphere, I've purposefully said here an n sphere. So what I mean is I mean a sphere in that number of dimensions. So in three dimensions, this is an actual sphere. In two dimensions, it would be a circle. In four dimensions, it would be a 4D sphere, whatever, whatever that is, right? Five dimensions, it would be the five dimensional equivalent of a sphere. So this is what Poincaré said at the time. Um, it's kind of obvious for n1, 2, and 3. So they were all done um, because in, well, I've just kind of described to you, if I've got something that's smooth, so has no sharp edges and has no holes, then I can just imagine it's made out of rubber and I'm thinking 3D. If I've got a ball of blue tack or a ball of Play-Doh, if I can just roll it together and get a sphere. And that's what I mean by can be deformed into. So it's kind of obviously true in 1D, 2D, and 3D, because you can build the model and you can do it yourself. Now, the tricky bit is Poincaré expects this to be true for all dimensions. Um, so it was in, I'm going to get the years correct, so I'm going to check this. It was in 1961, so 57 years later, um, when Stephen Smale, American mathematician, um, I actually, I got to meet um, Stephen Smale in about six months ago now and took a selfie with him. So you should totally check out my selfie with Stephen Smale on my Instagram uh, profile, obviously at Tom Rocks Maths. But uh, he didn't look too happy, but he did let me take a selfie with him, which was awesome. Um, so he proved it for n greater than or equal to 6. So he came up with a very clever proof that showed the Poincaré conjecture, this thing, any smooth, finite object with no holes can be turned into a sphere. Stephen Smale in 1961 showed it was true for n greater than or equal to 6. So all the way up to infinity and including n equals 6. Then it took a further 22 years, 1983, along comes Michael Friedman, another American mathematician, and he proved it for n equals 5. And then this remained unsolved until the year 2000, and then in the year 2000, the millennium problem, the million dollar question in the year 2000 was, can you prove this statement for n equals four. So is it true that in four dimensions, a smooth finite object with no holes can be deformed into a four sphere? That was the million dollar question. And it was solved in 2002 by Gregory Perelman. Uh, and there's a whole story here. Unfortunately, I don't think I can go into massive amounts of detail about the story, but in short, Perelman had been working on this since the early 90s. So he clearly wasn't motivated by the money in any way. He was just a topologist, wanted to solve an interesting problem. And he published his proof on the archive. So he just posted it online in 2002 without really telling anyone or doing anything, just kind of put it there and then disappeared. Um, and it was amazing. Like at first, you know, it took a while to gain traction because lots of people publish proofs online all the time. But eventually, people began to realize, like, no, this is legit. This is a real proof. And he was finally, uh, in 2006, was awarded the Fields Medal for his work, uh, which he turned down, I should add. Um, 
And then in 2010, it took another four years, he was awarded the Millennium Prize. And again, he actually turned down the Millennium Prize in 2010. So Gregory Perelman solved it, published it online, won the Fields Medal, like the biggest award you can get as a young mathematician, turned it down, was eventually awarded the million dollars, and even turned that down as well. So awesome story. You should totally look up Gregory Perelman and the story uh, behind this. I don't want to say any more because it's kind of all, uh, it's all kind of gossip because he never really did any interviews. Um, so uh, most of the, <laughs> the stories that are told around his proof are kind of from hearsay rather than from him himself. But there's loads of interesting stuff about it, right, as to why he would turn down the prize money, why, you know, he turned down the Fields Medal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the Poincaré conjecture, which finally leads me on to Navier Stokes. So, and this is going to be the final Manning problem. I'm going to have my final bit of champagne before I start taking my clothes off. All right, champagne's gone. Um, class number two for the day. Um, right, so the plan is to talk about the seventh and final millennium problem, uh, Navier Stokes, my favorite. Uh, this one I'm going to do in the style of my equation strip series. So I'm going to do it in uh, three layers, is the plan. So to kick us off, we have layer number one the equations themselves and what they model. Uh, and I should just warn everyone, this is the part where I will be taking off some of my clothes. So if you're not into that, by all means, you can you, you can leave. I will not be offended. Um, right. So Navier Stokes equations. This is our main problem, number seven. Navier Stokes. OK, so the equations themselves, if I'm to write out the most general form uh, that I can for Navier Stokes. That's going to be um, first one. Let's go with this formulation uh, d rho by dt plus grad dot rho u equals naught. My first one, my second uh, Navier Stokes equation is going to be uh, rho capital D u by dt. It's going to be equal to um, grad dot sigma um, plus rho f. OK, so this is the um, a more general version of Navier Stokes than I normally talk about. Um, so there's a reason I'm starting with the most general version, because these equations, as they are written, will model basically any fluid uh, on Earth, possibly any fluid in space, who even knows? But any fluid you can think of is modeled by this set of equations. So the top one is one equation, because it's a scalar equation. And the second one is um, a vector equation. So there are actually three components to this equation, because we have a vector, vector, vector. This, isn't, this is a tensor. So that will turn into a vector. Um, so there's actually four equations in total. This one's one, and there are three hidden in here. Now, these equations will model the um, uh, behavior and the motion, they'll describe the motion of any fluid that you can think of. So I've got a few examples that I like to talk about here. So one of them being uh, something like aerodynamics. So um, if you're trying to build a supersonic jet, so at the moment there's a lot of, uh, or at least I guess pre pre-virus and pre-lockdown, there's a lot of talk about, uh, at least from aerodynamics people I've been speaking to, uh, about the excitement of building the first um, sort of hypersonic uh, passenger plane. Um, and that's like a very, very interesting uh, engineering and aerodynamics problem. And that is going to require Navier Stokes, because you're trying to model airflow around an object. So air is behaving like a fluid here. And so it's going to satisfy these equations. Um, then you've got something that I work on. So looking at uh, climate modeling, for example, looking at the Earth's atmosphere, um, even on a smaller scale, looking at local weather systems. That's going to require the Navier-Stokes equations because the clouds um, in the sky, the air streams, the Gulf streams, etc., cetera, um, in the atmosphere, the tides and the waves in the ocean, it's all the motion of fluids. And it's all going to be described 
by these equations. And you can even go further and look at the motion of ice sheets. So the, again, in the last few years, there's been various news articles about the ice sheets in Antarctica, uh, how they're receding, how they're melting and calving, which is when part of it falls off. Um, and all of that, that motion of the ice is again explained by these equations uh, because ice will behave like a fluid. If you've ever seen a time-lapse uh, video of a glacier flowing down a mountain and you speed it up, you know, if you record a glacier for a year and then you speed up the video, it looks like it's flowing like a river. So ice, with some appropriate modifications, is modeled by these equations. Uh, and then the final example I wanted to mention is blood flow uh, around the body. So this is a very, very um, practical use of the Navier-Stokes. I think all of the applications are practical, but this one in particular, because if we, uh, we model blood flow around the body, right, it's a fluid being pumped around your body through a pressure, right? Your heart creates a pressure, forces the blood around your body. So the, um, the motion is explained by these equations, but then if we understand these equations better, which is kind of what the million dollar question is, can we improve our understanding of these equations? It's very vague, but that's how you get the million dollars, improving our understanding or unlocking the secrets of Navier-Stokes. Um, so if we're able to do that, then what that's gonna mean is we understand blood flow better, and so you can design better drugs, because you can design drugs specifically to be delivered to special parts of the body faster, more efficiently, more reliably, etc. So these equations are, they really are amazing, right? You can tell I obviously love them, <laughs> because they have so, such a wide range of, of different applications. Uh, right, so I think that is pretty much our um, first layer. So I'm just gonna pop over here and I'll be back in a second. I'm gonna have to excuse the wires. Uh, <laughs> this is the, the one downside of having um, improved my equipment means that I um, now <laughs> have a, an actual good mic, but it means I've got wires stuck to me. So anyway, stripping back to our second layer of the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what these equations represent and sort of where they came from. So um, the equations themselves, uh, what we've actually got going on here is, um, okay, how's the best way for me to do this? Let's start with the overarching sort of where they came from, what they represent. So the first one here is the conservation of mass. So this equation, the top line, it, I don't know whether it uh, does or doesn't look like um, it's got anything to do with mass, but this top line tells you that if I have a, um, a section of fluid, a blob of fluid, and then the fluid moves around a little bit, perhaps with some velocity, then as long as I don't add anything to the fluid or take away anything from the fluid, then the mass of the fluid will be ent entirely the same. So if you're, um, so in other words, mass is conserved, right? So if you have a blob of fluid, it moves around, nothing's added, nothing's taken away, then I have the same amount of fluid, and so therefore, um, I have conservation of mass. Mass is conserved in the system. So that's what this equation means. I'm going to talk later a little bit more about where it comes from, but for now, um, let's just believe me, this is telling you that mass is conserved, which is a very reasonable thing to expect for a fluid when you don't add things or take things away. Now, the second one here, this, believe it or not, is Newton's second law. So this is Newton's second law, also known as uh, conservation of linear momentum. Uh, and also, of course, known as F equals MA. Also known as F equals MA. Now, to see why this might be um, Newton's second law, what we can do is think a little bit about some of these terms. So what I mean here is, for example, um, this first term, this rho, so rho here is the density. 
So this is the density of your fluid. And so in this context, I mean, density, of course, is not mass, but density times volume would give you the mass. So this is kind of playing the role of the mass in my Newton's second law. So this term here is kind of, squiggly line, is kind of the mass. And then the next term, I've got a time derivative of the velocity. So I've got u, which is a velocity, and then I've got the time rate of change of that velocity. So if velocity changes over time, that is how we define the acceleration, acceleration or deceleration. Your change in velocity is an acceleration. So this is exactly the acceleration term. And then everything over here on this side, this thing here is called the Cauchy stress tensor. And this basically represents, as we will see in layer three, this represents the internal forces. So this is our internal forces. And then at the end, this F represents the external or body forces. External slash body forces. So overall, just to recap, we've got a density times an acceleration. So this is like mass times acceleration. This is the MA in Newton's second law. And then the whole of the right-hand side just is various forces. We've got the internal forces here, and then we've got our external forces here. So this whole equation is just F equals MA. It's just Newton's second law, which seems, again, a very sensible thing to um, sort of talk about and expect to be true for a moving fluid. So equation one tells you mass is conserved. Equation two tells you that Newton's second law holds. So that in sort of from a physics perspective completes the second layer of our equations and explains what and where the Navier-Stokes equations come from. So Right, stripping back to our of the Navier-Stokes equations, um, I want to actually go more in depth than I've gone in any of my previous uh, videos talking about this. And I want to actually show you why the uh, the top equation is the conservation of mass. So at this point, I'm going to rub off the bottom equation. I'm going to rub off um, Newton's second law, and we're just going to concentrate on mass conservation. So, <clears throat> and this is where it's gonna get more mathematical for those of you who've been hoping for some real formulas. So our third layer is going to be looking at deriving the conservation of mass equation. Now, um, this, as I've said, tells me that mass is conserved. So if you think about what that means uh, mathematically, that says that if I have uh, an expression m for my mass, if mass is going to be conserved, then that means that the mass will not change over time, right? So if mass is conserved, nothing is added or taken away, so mass will not change over time. So that means that the time derivative, dm by dt, must be equal to zero. This is exactly mathematically how you would write out conservation of mass. Now, if you want to sort of go a step further, which we do, we need to write down, well, what is the mass of my fluid? So if I have some fluid over here, and this is going to be at time, let's say t equals naught. So it's a volume at time t equals naught. And it has some density rho. 
Okay, so some function has a density, which could be a function of time and space, who knows, but it's got this particular shape. Then suppose my fluid moves at some speed u, so it has a velocity u, and my blob of fluid moves, then maybe it now has a different shape. Okay, so maybe it now looks like that. So the volume here is v of t at some later time, but the density is still the same. So this is a, um, a situation that uh, hopefully you can picture. So imagine this is a section of fluid in a river. So it has a fixed density and it has some shape to it, it has a volume, and then it moves at some speed u down the river, and then it has a new shape. So the volume here is a function of time, this is really important, it has a new shape, uh, and it's moved at some speed u. So what that tells you is your mass, which remember we want the time rate of change of the mass to be zero. So the mass is equal to the integral over the volume of my density. So this triple integral is my mass. You take your density function rho and you integrate over the volume that you're interested in. And that will give you your entire mass, right? Density is mass times volume, but because we have this time dependent volume and density might be a function of space, instead of just multiplying by the volume, integrate over the volume. Now, we want to show that this is zero because we're saying mass is conserved. So the time derivative of mass is going to be zero. Mass doesn't change with respect to time. So what we want to do is take our derivative d by dt take this inside our integral. Now, some of you may know how to do this, may have seen this before. You take your full derivative outside and it becomes a partial derivative inside. It's called Leibniz rule. So Leibniz rule would say, take this inside, it becomes a partial derivative inside my integral. However, when you apply Leibniz rule, you have a constant volume over which you're integrating. However, here we don't have that because here our volume depends on time. So when I do my time derivative, I have to somehow account for the fact that I have time dependence in my limit. And the way we do that is using a theorem, which you can go ahead and prove or you can look it up. I'm just going to state it for now. It's called uh, Reynolds Transport Theorem. But what Reynolds transport theorem tells you is how to take a time derivative when you have time dependence in your volume. So Reynolds transport theorem says that this uh, is equal to the triple integral over the volume. But then instead of just a partial derivative, you get the partial derivative that you expect from Leibniz rule plus a divergence. So you get grad dot rho u dv. So this is basically exactly what Reynolds transport theorem says. You have to, you know, you can go away and look up the proof or try and prove it yourself if you really want. But you use this result to take the derivative inside the integral. And now we've got that this must be equal to zero. So then the final step to get this to be our equation at the top, our conservation of mass equation, is that here I have assumed my volume, my v of t, I have assumed this to be arbitrary. So I haven't specified that this has to have a particular shape or has to have a particular value. So if I'm integrating something over any shape I want and I get zero, then that tells you the thing I'm integrating has to be zero. So you can make this more rigorous. You can consider uh, your volume. If you make your volume be 0, 0, 0, a little bump, and then 0 everywhere else, and you call this like a radius epsilon bump, and you let epsilon tend to 0. But either way, if this thing, this triple integral is 0 over all possible arbitrary volumes, then the thing inside the integral has to, in fact, be 0. So you just take this and put it up here, 
and you get conservation of mass. Now you basically do the exact same for your second one to get uh, Newton's equation. So if I just, um, to get Newton's second law, sorry, the conservation of momentum. So I will very, very quickly outline how that works. And then I think we'll call it a day. So the idea then is, if you think about uh, Newton's, second, Newton's second law, force is mass times acceleration, which is also equal to um, the uh, rate of d by dt of the uh, linear momentum, isn't it? So of mv. Now, so Newton's second law, f equals rate of time rate of change of the momentum. So again, exactly as we just did, you write down d by dt of triple integral of my momentum. My momentum here is the integral over the volume of the density times the velocity. Um, integral dv. So this is my time rate of change of linear momentum. This has to be equal to the forces. So here you have internal force plus external force. And then all you do is exactly as we did before, you take this inside by the Reynolds transport theorem, you write out what this is, which is like a triple integral of grad dot stress tensor. Your external force is triple integral rho times F dV. And then you put everything together. You're integrating it all to give you zero. So the thing you're integrating must be zero. So when you do that, you get your second Navier-Stokes equation. Right, I've definitely gone on far too long. We're nearing an hour and a half of what was meant to be an hour live stream. But I have just done all seven um, Millennium problems in 90 minutes. So you know what? I reckon I deserve another glass of champagne, I think. <laughs> so um, I was going to say I can do some questions. But as I said, I already think I've gone on far too long. So maybe I will do some kind of uh, Q&A or something in the future. Uh, where I'll let everybody uh, ask questions and different things. But for now, um, again, thank you. I, I think I do deserve the bottle, <laughs> Sir Isaac. <laughs> um, so again, thank you so much, everybody, um, for, for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing to my channel. Thank you for joining me for the celebration. Of course, you can rewatch this, right? This is going to be available on YouTube tomorrow by the time they process it. So you can come back and rewatch this and learn about all seven uh, Millennium Problems. Uh, and watch me drink another glass of champagne. <laughs> I'm going to go now, finish off the bottle, and, uh, and continue celebrating. So again, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I will actually be back in a week with another live stream, because next Friday, at the exact same time, I'll be doing my final uh, Q&A for Tom Rock's Maths Appeal. Uh, so we'll start by talking about probability, but then I'll open it up to live chat uh, questions. So again, thank you, everyone. Hope you've enjoyed Million Problems. Hope you enjoyed me doing Equation Strip Live. Uh, and I'll see you all soon.